We've all probably heard the expression, careful what you wish for, you just might get it. It means you might think you want something now, but if you were to acquire it, you may come to find out it's more than you can handle. Here it's assumed that someone wouldn't want to get what they wish for if they knew it could ultimately destroy them. But what if this assumption is mistaken? What if, in some cases, more than we can handle is exactly what we're looking for? Occupying a central place in the work of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan is this idea that enjoyment of a certain kind can actually go beyond pleasure and become pain. Lacan called this excess enjoyment jouissance, and far from an anomalous feature of only his most disturbed patients, Lacan took this jouissance to be something fundamental, something that all of us have to grapple with in one form or another. But how can we make sense of something that's supposed to go beyond its own limits? How can pleasure become pain? How can there be such a thing as too much enjoyment? Like many of Lacan's concepts, jouissance is somewhat hard to define. One thing that I find helpful in understanding or at least beginning to understand the concepts of Lacan is by way of example. And one of my favorite examples of jouissance can be found in Robert Eggers' horror film, The Lighthouse. In The Lighthouse, we see a character who comes to think that some mysterious, ultimate object can satisfy all of his desires. But, as the end of the film shows, if we could even access such an object, like even if that is possible, the experience would almost certainly be more than we can handle. I think the lighthouse shows a disturbing look at the problem of desire, and that the work of Jacques Lacan offers a prescription for dealing with it. In this video, I'll be looking at the lighthouse as a way of understanding jouissance and other concepts in Lacanian psychoanalysis. I'll begin by defining jouissance as it's used in the work of Jacques Lacan. Next, I'll try to analyze and interpret the behavior of the film's main character, leading up to the fateful decision he makes at the end. Finally, I'll focus on that decision and its outcome, and try to explain how the film's dazzling, disturbing climax can help us to better understand this jouissance. Necessarily, this is going to involve spoilers, so I thought I would let you know so that you don't come back to me and ask me why I spilled my beans. Jacques Lacan was a French psychoanalyst. He's known for blending linguistics, philosophy, literature, and other disciplines in his practice. He developed a highly complex but endlessly interesting system of psychoanalytic theory. Much of his work centered around desire, what it is, where does it come from, and how it manifests in our actions, our thoughts, and our speech. One of the most important concepts along these lines in Lacan's work is that of jouissance. In French, jouissance means something like enjoyment, but it especially connotes a kind of enjoyment that's excessive, something that's too much to handle, something that feels so good it actually hurts. In his 17th seminar, Lacan described jouissance in this way. Once you have started, you never know where it will end. It begins with a tickle and ends in a blaze of petrol. That's always what jouissance is. Most of us would probably agree that a desire for pleasure and an aversion to pain motivate at least some of our behaviors. For Lacan, however, that's only part of the picture. There are some behaviors which can't be so easily explained by this pleasure-seeking, pain-avoiding paradigm. For example, why does someone with obsessive-compulsive disorder seem to fixate precisely on the very ideas that cause them anguish? Why does an alcoholic pursue their addiction, sometimes even to the point of their own death? And then there's behaviors that seem to blur the line itself between pleasure and pain, from engaging in BDSM to eating really spicy foods, some experiences can't be neatly classified as exclusively pleasant or exclusively painful. At the end of The Lighthouse, we see a man undergo an experience that seems to be both pleasant and painful, 
ecstatic, and anguishing. We also see that in the events leading up to this experience, the character was warned in a number of different ways not to pursue this particular object of desire. He was told in so many words, you just might get it. But he didn't listen. And a lot of times, neither do we. But why? Why is that? Because if Lacan is right, then at the end of our own personal tickle, whatever that happens to be, there awaits this blaze of petrol. So what I want to know and what I want to try and explore in this video is why do we so often run headfirst into that flame? The Lighthouse is a horror film directed by Robert Eggers and released in 2019. It stars Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe. Set in the late 19th century, the film centers on two lighthouse keepers who are stationed off the coast of New England. Ephraim Winslow, played by Pattinson, is a novice in this profession, while the much older Thomas Wake, played by Defoe, has been tending lighthouses for some time. As a veteran wiki, Thomas Wake is shown to hold immense power over Winslow, subjecting him to meaningless busywork, refusing to help with the less desirable jobs, and docking his pay for minor infractions. To be fair, Winslow is hardly the most adept or enthusiastic worker. He doesn't always complete the tasks he's supposed to be working on, he complains pretty often, and he spends quite a lot of time indulging himself in the supply shed. Needless to say, Winslow definitely doesn't go above and beyond his duties. With that said, Wake and Winslow are supposed to be a team, and yet the brunt of the work seems to have fallen on Winslow's shoulders. Winslow resents Wake for mistreating him, and perhaps that's somewhat understandable. Over time, however, Winslow's resentment shifts, mutates. It eventually comes to rest on something that is far less tangible. As the more experienced Wiki, Wake holds the keys to the lighthouse itself, specifically the uppermost chamber that houses the flame. At first, this seems reasonable, and yet it soon becomes apparent that there is more to the flame than meets the eye. At least, this is what Winslow comes to believe. He becomes suspicious after sneaking up the stairs one night and finding Wake sitting naked in front of the flame, appearing to enjoy some kind of powerful experience. Although it's never made clear what exactly that experience consisted of, the possibility stoke Winslow's curiosity to no end. But whatever Wake is experiencing in there, he's not interested in sharing. Or perhaps he doesn't think Winslow is worthy. Whatever his reasons might be, Wake never allows Winslow to enter that room. This leads Winslow to construct a narrative around Wake, the lighthouse, and his own desires. He comes to believe that whoever holds the keys to the light holds the keys to some ultimate experience. Whether it's knowledge, power, or pleasure, the lighthouse flame comes to represent for him the one thing he must have. This is very interesting from a Lacanian point of view because it showcases one of Lacan's most well-known ideas, namely that our desires are not necessarily our own. As Lacan famously put it, man's desire is the desire of the other. But what does that mean? Well, most of us can probably think of times where we've desired some object or perhaps desired another person, and Lacan acknowledges that this is, in fact, one direction that desire can flow. This is what he would call the desire for the other. But then there are desires that don't actually come from us, but rather from our inferences about what other people want. So in other words, we want what we think other people want. In reality, we might have no idea what someone else actually wants. They might not know what they actually want. That's why it's inferential. Nevertheless, this desire of the other can form the basis of a lot of the narratives that we hold and can motivate our pursuit of the objects we believe are desirable. So we see someone else pursuing something, so we think we should also pursue it. We think somebody is enjoying something, so we think maybe I'll enjoy that too. That's kind of what happens with Winslow here. When Winslow sees Wake enjoying some mysterious experience in the lighthouse, he infers 
that this experience is something he might enjoy as well. Not only that, but Wake won't let Winslow share this experience. He won't let Winslow see what he's seeing. So what else is Winslow supposed to think, except that there is something special about the lighthouse, and that Wake has somehow conspired against him to keep him from enjoying it too? In this way, Winslow's desire of the other eventually comes to drive his pursuit of the lighthouse and grounds the narrative that he constructs around Wake. He comes to view the lighthouse as the ultimate object of desire and Wake as the obstacle keeping him from it. But it's really important to note that Winslow doesn't start out with this narrative. And he doesn't start out thinking that there's anything special about the lighthouse. In the beginning of the film, he thinks Wake is just another crappy boss. Not that he holds the keys to salvation or anything like that. And as far as the lighthouse goes, if anything, when the film starts out, Winslow seems to be generally annoyed by it, just like he's annoyed by pretty much everything else about his job. Winslow's obsession with the light and his paranoia surrounding Wake develop gradually throughout the film. It's only after he repeatedly fails to satisfy other desires that his goals become consolidated in the pursuit of this singular, all-encompassing object, the one that's supposed to provide the ultimate enjoyment. So in order to make sense of his eventual decision to kill Wake, climb the steps, and access the lighthouse flame, we have to understand his behaviors that lead up to that decision. For starters, Winslow is easily frustrated, quick to anger, and capable of violence. We see him curse and kick things. He launches into a long soliloquy on the joys of eating bloody steak, specifically bloody steak. He makes that point very clear. We see him thinking about killing Wake in his sleep. And as we eventually come to learn, Winslow basically murdered his last employer when he worked for a logging company. If you want to be technical, I guess you could say he allowed his boss to die. But for simplicity's sake, we'll say that he murdered him. But suffice it to say, Winslow has trouble managing his anger. That's no mystery. And if pushed far enough, he's capable of extreme violence. In one especially shocking scene, Winslow gets fed up with a particular seagull that's been harassing him and smashes the bird to literal pieces, hitting it against a hard surface over and over and over again. It's really hard to put into words just how unrelenting this scene is. As if the actual violence itself weren't disturbing enough, the killing just seems to drag on forever. When I saw this in the theater, during this scene, I actually remember someone behind me saying out loud, all right, that's enough. It is, in the literal sense of the word, overkill. It seems the only thing more relentless than Winslow's capacity for seagull shredding is his sexual appetite. At the start of the film, after settling into his cot, Winslow discovers a scrimshaw of a mermaid sewn into the mattress. Later, Winslow uses the scrimshaw as a visual aid for his self-gratification, and images of mermaids begin to populate his hallucinations. But no matter how many trips he takes to the outhouse, neither the scrimshaw nor the visions can satisfy him. The reason for this should be obvious, given that mermaids are not real, no one can ever successfully court their love. It's not just Winslow. But rather than dampen Winslow's desire, this impossibility only seems to fuel it. Although his fantasies leave him unsatisfied, Winslow returns again and again to the same impossible image. Repetition and a lack of insight are both central features of Winslow's character. Take Winslow's last boss, for example. When Winslow allowed his former employer to die in a logging accident, he probably saw this as kind of a way out. At the time, he may have seen his last boss as the source of all his problems. If he could just get rid of him, everything would be fine. Well, of course, that turned out to not be true. It didn't solve any of his problems. In fact, it introduced more. After killing his boss, or letting him die, however you want to phrase it, Winslow had to go out on the run and find a new job. I guess Winslow never heard the expression, 
wherever you go, you take yourself with you. But that's exactly what happened. Because the same resentments he had against his last boss, he now holds against Wake. The same behaviors he almost certainly exhibited on the job as a logger, he now exhibits on the job as a wiki. And the same lack of insight that led Winslow to see murder as a solution to his problems before will lead him to kill again. We see the same pattern and a similar outcome in Winslow's destruction of the seagull. He tolerates the seagull's harassment for a little while, but eventually he reaches a breaking point. Now, in theory, I suppose we could grant that Winslow was just defending himself. Like, the seagull kept pecking at him, and unless he did something, it wasn't going to stop. But this explanation falls apart in the face of Winslow's sheer brutality. Winslow doesn't just want the seagull to stop pecking at him. He doesn't just want to bring an end to its life. He wants to bring an end to its very physical composition, its very structure. He wants to destroy it. Towards the end of the film, Winslow reaches a similar breaking point with his own sexual frustration. In an attempt to free himself of its power, he breaks the mermaid scrimshaw into pieces, proudly displaying the broken figure to Wake and laughing hysterically. Of course, destroying this particular arbitrary object does nothing. The cause of his desire is not in the scrimshaw, and it's certainly not in Wake, it's in himself. It's a consequence of being human that Winslow has sexual desires. This is crucial in understanding his eventual ascent to the top of the lighthouse tower. If the destruction of the seagull and the murder of his last employer show us what Winslow does when he reaches a breaking point with his anger, then the destruction of the scrimshaw shows us what he does when he reaches a breaking point with desire. And this is a recurring mistake Winslow makes. He thinks that by destroying something, it goes away. It solves the problem. And while that is true, if you're dealing with something that actually is an external problem, it's not in Winslow's case. With Winslow, the sources of his problems are primarily himself. So destroying external objects, animals, people, none of that will suffice. Yet, Winslow repeatedly tries to solve his problems through violence and destruction. When faced with an animal, an object, or another person whom he takes to be an obstacle, Winslow resorts to destruction or murder. Rather than redress whatever problems he might have had, this only sets in motion worse consequences, such as having to go on the lamb after killing his boss, or pissing off the ghosts of dead sailors after he kills the seagull. Because he never addresses whatever underlying issue is causing him to lash out in violence, it's guaranteed to happen again, which it does. And the same problem besets Winslow in the way he tries to handle his desires. Winslow makes repeated attempts to satisfy various urges, but in every instance he's left wanting more. He tries to project his desires onto a variety of different objects, but none of them can really satisfy him. He mistakenly takes these objects to be the cause of his desire and destroys them in an attempt to free himself. But this only starts another vicious cycle, because it's only a matter of time before he settles on some other object, some other thing, which he believes can finally satisfy him. So, is that what happens when Winslow makes his fateful ascent up the stairs, reaches into the light, and is ultimately cast out? Is this consolidation of all desire into a single object the result of his failure to satisfy his other desires? Yes and no. On the one hand, Winslow clearly experiences a mixture of pleasure and pain. He crosses boundaries that were not supposed to be crossed in pursuit of this object. And after experiencing what looks like the ultimate satisfaction, he is thrown out into utter destruction and agony. But let's think about this. What is the meaning of ultimate satisfaction, if not the end of desire? Like, if I am completely and finally satisfied, then I want for nothing. 
I cease to desire. And according to Lacan, that's when we're really in trouble, like deadly trouble. Because jouissance in the work of Jacques Lacan is very closely related to the death drive in the work of Sigmund Freud. And despite what the name might suggest, the death drive is not the literal desire for death. That's actually not even something Freud would have understood because he didn't think we actually believe in our own mortality. So he definitely didn't think we desire it. No, the death drive is not the drive towards death, but rather the death of the drives themselves. For Lacan, nothing is more undesirable than the lack of desire. In spite of all the trouble it can cause us when we don't get what we want, Lacan would say it's better to have an unmet desire than to not want anything at all. To properly deal with excess enjoyment, one cannot simply go to the other extreme, the extreme of bottling things up or stuffing them down. Instead, as Lacanian psychoanalyst Owen Hewitson puts it, we have to learn to walk between the tickle and the blaze of petrol. But that's not always easy, and it's ultimately what Winslow fails to do. Repressing desire does not defend against excessive desire, it almost guarantees it. Repressing anger does not defend against outbursts of anger. Again, if you or someone you know has ever flipped the lid, blown the gasket, or however you want to phrase it, then you know that repressing anger, or any other emotion for that matter, uh, is not the solution. Of course, neither is wanton abandon, flying off the handle at every little thing, crying over every slight inconvenience. Neither of these extremes is the answer. The answer is balance. The climax of The Lighthouse is, I think, arguably one of the most iconic scenes in recent film history. In it, we see a brilliant, horrifying depiction of the consequences of failing to heed that perennial warning. Be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. In the events leading up to this fateful encounter, we are shown why sometimes the very proscription against pursuing some object of our desire really only stokes the flames of our passion for it. And we see how it can be tempting to construct narratives that might explain why we aren't successful at getting what we want. But of course, these narratives are not always helpful. I think of Winslow as the kind of guy who says, I'll never love again after having his heart broken. At least that's how I think of him after he destroys the scrimshaw, which he thinks holds some kind of power over him. I guess what Lacan would say to that is, good luck, but you'll be back. And if that's the case, then maybe the solution isn't figuring out how to eliminate desire, but how to manage it better. If we will be back, then maybe through changing the way we think, the way we respond, maybe we can change where we come back to. Maybe we can come back to someplace better instead of continually returning to the same stinky, rainy rock, as Winslow unfortunately seems to do. Winslow is a great example of what not to do if we want to get a handle on our own vicious cycles, our own bad habits, our own maladaptive symptoms. Lacan points a way out, or perhaps more appropriately, he points out an alternative direction that we can take. And that starts with accessing not some mysterious object outside of us that we imagine holds the key to our salvation, but rather it starts with accessing what's in here, or maybe in here, maybe both. Something in here, that's where it starts, because this is where the problem comes from. That's what Winslow never really seems to recognize. To paraphrase Carl Jung, Unless we get a hold of our unconscious, we'll go on repeating the same mistakes we always have, but we'll call it fate. Winslow is baffled by and ultimately succumbs to so-called fate. But he never realizes that this so-called fate is nothing more than the culmination of his own choices. 
I hope you enjoyed watching and listening to this as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, let me know what you think about this film, this analysis, Lacan, or any other related topics in the comments below. Thanks.